we're very happy to have you all here tonight. As we conclude our um, ADC Festival of Fame, tonight we proudly welcome laureates Ruth Ansel and Marshall Arisman. And I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator this evening, Stephen Heller, co-chair, MFA design, designer as author and entrepreneur, School of Visual Arts. Stephen? Hello. Thank you. So um, I had the great honor uh, a few nights ago of emceeing the uh, gala event where our honorees got their awards. And it, this has been a double treat for me. Uh, in this case, as in uh, last Thursday, everybody who got an award has some meaning for me uh, in my life. And these two honorees, Marshall Arisman and Ruth Ansel have more than the other two. Uh, they have impacted my life in such a way that I can't describe, but I will. Uh, first off, I, I write obituaries for the New York Times of designers and illustrators, and I'm so glad I can talk about these people while they're still alive. Yeah, so they've made it to this point. Uh, first off, Marshall. Marshall Arisman was the one who threw me out of the School of Visual Arts when I was trying to dodge the draft during the Vietnam War. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, he is an amazing individual. Uh, he was the first real professional artist that I ever met. Um, he not only threw me out, but he actually accepted a commission that I gave him for uh, doing covers for Screw Magazine. Uh, and he was uh, the one who hired me back to the School of Visual Arts, where I worked with him for many years. Uh, and we've done four books together. And hopefully that's not over. Uh, Ruth Ansel. Ruth Ansel I met at a party uh, that was given by the illustrator Brad Holland a few years after I was thrown out of the SVA, and um, she looked at a portfolio that I had, and I guess either took pity on me or liked it, and um, introduced me to the design director of uh, the New York Times, who hired me uh, right away to be the op-ed art director, and I stayed at the New York Times for 33 years. Uh, the deal was I was supposed to work with Ruth one day a week. Uh, I wasn't very good. So Ruth uh, eased me out, but it was nice, and I, I really owe everything in my professional career to Ruth. Uh, it is one of those things where, because of knowing her, uh, I learned what art was all about. We used to get in fights in uh, uh, taxi cabs and other vehicles about the difference between looking in books at art and looking at art on walls. And I won't go into detail, but Ruth was right, I was wrong. I chose the books. Um, the other thing that is very important in terms of getting this Hall of Fame honor is that everybody who has gotten it is someone who has very big shoulders. Uh, you stand on these shoulders, and other people stand on the shoulders that are standing on the shoulders, and so on and so forth. And you can look at the work of Marshall, you can look at the work of Ruth, and you can see the people who have risen because of their interventions, because of their work. Marshall as a teacher and as a, an illustrator, Ruth as an art director and an empresario. Uh, it's very clear uh, that there's lineage that comes from these people and have created uh, one of the foundations of our history, of our legacy. So it's a real joy for me to be here and be able to help celebrate them with you. What we're going to do tonight is uh, uh, each one is going to come up individually, uh, talk for 10 or so minutes, show some images, and then we're going to sit down and talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our first is Marshall Arisman. Please come on up, Marshall.
thank all of you for coming. Um, I decided I would actually show you my first portfolio, um, primarily because I started in graphic design. I went to Pratt. I got out in 1960. Uh, General Motors sent a recruiter. Uh, I didn't want the job. I went in to get a job, went in to get out of an English class. And the more I didn't want this job, the more they wanted me. It's been the story of my life. Um, so at any rate, I got hired and went to Detroit. And I realized after a month that I was, number one, drinking heavily. Uh, and number two, my body was shutting down. I, I would wake up in the morning, my leg would be totally numb. And so I would actually drag my leg to General Motors' office. Right. <laughs> and I decided that maybe, right, my body was telling some, me something. And so I quit. I went to Europe. I went to Europe to get laid. Uh, I didn't go to Europe to look at art. And when I got to Paris, nobody spoke English. I spoke no French. And I couldn't talk to anybody. And then I met a guy in a cafe one night, had paint all over his pants, had paint on his sweatshirt, was carrying a Van Gogh book. And I heard him speak English. And I said, excuse me, you, you an American? I said, yeah. And I said, well, obviously, you're an artist. I would like to see your work. And he said, ah, I said, you know, you're the only one in two years who's asked to see my work. The great thing about Paris in 1960, 61, was that to say you were an artist was enough. It is a very American concept to say, where do you show? Do you make a living at it? So he was getting meat discounts because he said he was an artist. And he had a good rap on Van Gogh and whatever. And he finally said, I don't have any artwork. I'm not an artist. i actually a shoe salesman from Boston. And I came to Paris to get laid, right? And I said, I came to Paris to get laid, and I can't meet anybody. And he said, carry a sketchbook. <laughs> And I have never carried a sketchbook in my whole life, right? So I, the art whore, because I've already flunked out of graphic design, go to the cafe the next night with a sketchbook, okay? Uh, and sure enough, it was like a magnet. And I was like, you're an artist, you got whatever, whatever. I got laid. I, I, uh, I come back to New York and after the army, but... I come back to New York and I meet Tommy Younger. I mean, Steve was talking about, the nice thing about this for me is that, and Ruth won't remember any of these stories, but I'm starting out in illustration. Tommy Younger gives me a list of six art directors. We're now talking about the good old days when you could call any art director and they would see you. All you had to say was, I'm an illustrator, I got a portfolio, can I make an appointment? Everybody made an appointment. Dick Gangle at Sports Illustrated. Ruth was on the list. Um, so the work I'm going to show you is the work I showed to Ruth. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was running from graphic design. Uh, this is not against graphic design. This is about me realizing that I hated working with people. I do not like working with people. I do not like coming up with group concepts. I do not like all that stuff, right? I, I'm much more selfish than that. And all I wanted to do was self-explore. And so I get into illustration because it's avoiding graphic design and it's a freelance business. And so I go to see Ruth and sell at Harper's Bazaar. You have no memory of this, right? None, okay. It's funny where you get energy from. So Ruth comes out, and her partner, uh, Bea Feitler, comes out, and they look at my portfolio, which I will show you a little of. Not too good, folks, you know what I mean? No, the way I, did, I, I had devised a ripped-off style from artists like Andre Francois, Savignac, because I couldn't draw. And so I was looking at people, and I was dumb. I mean, 
that I thought, well, they can't draw either, and they're doing okay. So I, I developed this formula, right? Um, and this is one of the few jobs I got. Okay, so I see Ruth Ansel, I see Bea Feitler, and they are, in fact, encouraging. It's funny what gives you energy to keep going. Uh, their encouragement, they gave me a list of other people to see. I walk out of there feeling like this may be worthwhile. Um, but I'm only making $3,000 a year doing this stuff. And what I've got is basically a formula. Uh, I got a formula about how I draw people. I got a formula about whatever it is I think I'm doing. I know, it looks pretty good. I could go back, you know. I, 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 I made a wrong turn, you know. I, I, I. So after three years of only making $3,000 a year, I failed, all right? So now I'm 28 years old and I'm a failure. I don't want to go back to graphics, I can't. I failed at illustration. And it finally occurred to me that I couldn't draw. That what I had done here was in essence found a formula. It was going nowhere, right? I was repeating myself. Um, and they're not bad. <laughs> so I start, there's a drawing here. Okay, I start drawing uh, because I know why I'm drawing because I can't draw. So I draw for a year and then I start doing these things. This is what I was doing. Uh, and then I get an exhibition. <laughs> oh, Screw Magazine. This is Steve Heller who called me up and said, uh, I got a job for you, right? Uh, you don't remember me, but you threw me out of school. I'm the art director of Screw Magazine. I hated this magazine. I'll work, I'm an art whore. I mean, I've done work for Playboy and Penthouse. Kind of I will not work for Hustler and I hated Screw Magazine. There was something too pulpy about it, too porno about it, right? So, but I think, wait a minute, I've done some drawings that I really didn't like that were kind of sexual, right? So, so I said to Steve, okay, no sketches, right? Two weeks, I bring you a finish, okay? You don't remember this either. So I bring him this drawing I had done six months before, okay? If you don't know what the drawing's about, it is a man who has cock. It's a bad pun, okay. And people are looking at his cock. So uh, Steve said, well, it's not the most erotic thing I've ever seen, but they run it. And I find out that outside of the op-ed page of the New York Times, more people that I know say to me, you know, I saw that cover a screw. Does that make sense? And I start to think, Wait a minute, who are these people? Does that make sense? Um, this is a piece I actually did for Ruth Ansel, who won't remember this story either, when she was an art director at the New York Times. Ruth Ansel is the only art director in my entire career who actually fought for a piece of art. It's a piece by Tom Wicker. Uh, it's about Washington. And I bring in the piece, and I am very aware at this point that my artwork, upside down, the mood is emotionally dark. And I'm also aware that when people do not like dark emotional work, that they rational, make a rational comment, like, what's a monkey doing there? What the hell's a donkey doing there? Okay. So I bring to Ruth the manuscript that I did this drawing from, underlined every single element in this drawing. Right? Ruth takes it into the editors. The editors say to Ruth, nah, we're not going to print it. <laughs> we don't like it. And Ruth says, the artist is out in the hallway. Tell me what to tell him. And they say what we all say. Yeah, I don't, what's the donkey doing there? I don't, you know, get the whatever. What's the flag doing there? Finally, they say after 20 minutes, Ruth, we are tired of talking about this. This piece feels like Nazi Germany, and we are not going to print it. Do you remember this at all, Ruth? And Ruth came out 
and said, it feels like Nazi Germany, they're not gonna print it, okay? Do another one, okay? So I do another one, exactly the same thing, it feels like Nazi Germany, and they printed it four inches. <laughs> uh, but you are the only art director who did that, Ruth. I mean, I've never had anybody stand up and get editors to finally admit that the elements in the drawing were less important uh, than the mood of the drawing. I've always known that. This is a job, it was Jim Jones. You remember the minister who gave everybody Kool-Aid in Ghana? Uh, and so I did this for Penthouse and they said, the only interesting thing about this article is Jim Jones did not drink the Kool-Aid and die. He had somebody shoot him because he saw how painful it was to be poisoned. So I did this drawing. The weird thing about this drawing is it looks a lot like Bob Guccione, who owns Penthouse. <laughs> so Bob Guccione called me up and said, you know, I just want to say something to you, kid. <laughs> Your drawing of Jim Jones looks a lot like me, right? I said, Bob, 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 that's not true. You're handsome, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly I'm in this weird situation where the paintings I'm doing for myself, this is one, are getting printed. Art directors are calling me up saying, you know, we got this weird article, you know, it's about iron. You paint all that metal shit, you know, you got anything we could use? <laughs> so I now get into the business of selling, I didn't get rich doing this, right? You get, what, 600 bucks or something? I, I now get in the business of selling my personal work as illustration. And I'm thinking, this is weird, you know, this is odd, right? Um, we're back to the New York Times, back to a piece I did for Ruth. Um, do you have any memory of this, Ruth? Why would you? <laughs> so I do a book about guns, right? Because my brother's been carrying a handgun since he was 15. He's now 75. He's a boat mechanic. He works on a lake alone. He lives in a town of 500 people. And last summer when I was visiting my brother, <laughs> he bent over to fix a motor and there was a 32 caliber taped to the middle of his back. It's been there since he was 15 years old. And I said, what the hell are you doing? I don't, what do you, I mean, you live in this place, you're working in this idea there are cranes and out here, whatever. I mean. And my brother says to me, every time I make any of these comments, the same thing, which is, you have lived in New York too long. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it means something. I walk away thinking, what does that mean? Maybe he's right. So I do a book about guns. I don't know if I should send it to my brother, who gives me all the reference on guns, and I don't know if I should send it to my mother, who's got major problems with being anybody, right? I mean, I'm 18 years old, my mother said, two deals, you promise never to live with me permanently again, and I promise never to live with you permanently again, and never send me a piece of your artwork. It upsets me, I will never hang it on my wall, and I actually think it's my fault. Okay. So I send this book to my mother, okay? There are 45 drawings of guns, and all violence, and all whatever, whatever. The only image my mother sees in the entire book is this one. My mother calls me on the phone and says, I have a question. I got your book, I looked at it. Why do you always draw people holding their dicks? I said, what? Well, okay, if you look closely at this drawing, there's a man holding his dick. It is the only thing my mother saw. My brother, who gave me all the gun reference, gave me an eight-page letter, the only one he's ever written to me, a critique of my drawing of guns. The 32 caliber on page four is good. The pump action, 12 gauge, not good. Not the right sight, the pump's off. <laughs> Does that make sense? I, I don't know what people see anymore. I, um, oh, this was the piece, this was the death penalty piece that was too violent. Yeah, this was funny. I get a call from Walter Bernard, 
right? And he said, I don't know how to tell you this. There's a movie coming out. It's got a character in it that looks like your painting. So I don't know. I don't know if it's an insult to ask you to do this or not. Right? You know. So he sends me this painting of Darth Vader, right? And nobody had seen him before. And I decide that I'm gonna have fun with it. So instead of doing a normal illustration, I do a five foot painting. And I don't like it, so I do a second one. Kind of bring it in and it was fun. We put it in the window and people were waving and shit. And then I got a letter from a kid with a photograph of this kid. And he's in Darth Vader pajamas, he's in a Darth Vader room, he's whatever, whatever. And he says, he's probably eight years old, and he said, you know, if you have any sketches, you know, whatever. And so I send him the five foot painting. So out there somewhere, right, is a kid with this painting, which will eventually turn up on eBay for a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Uh, this one they printed because editorially you could not not be against violent crime. So the violence in the image didn't bother them at all. It's like, oh shit, that's great, that's violent, you know, that's whatever it is. And I got a lot of letters from people saying, I'm canceling my time subscription, you know, that was horrific, my kids can't sleep. Uh, they loved it. For me, Time Magazine at that point was, I don't know what it was. It was a gateway to something. It meant if time did it, anybody could do it. So other art directors used them at this time cover to say, Time Magazine printed this guy, why can't we? People who like me uh, accuse me of being influenced by Francis Bacon. People who don't like me accuse me of being ripped off Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was important to me. In the 60s, there was no emotional figurative work going on. It was all pop art. It was all Andy Warhol soap screens of Marilyn Monroe. And I saw my first Bacon exhibition in 68 at the Guggenheim, and at the end of that spiral down, I thought, this man is dealing with emotional figurative work. And there was none to be around. I couldn't find any in America. So, yes. Uh, my sense of this time was that I wasn't Francis Bacon in the sense that my life was different and that if I just took the abuse I was getting, I would eventually work out of it. So, um, so yeah, this is my enlightened period. Are you ready? <laughs> this is as light as it gets, folks. I mean, they, they, I start to see auras, and I don't want to put them in my paintings because I don't want the heat from the New Age people. I do not want people taking me out in a Jeep somewhere in Arizona to find enlightenment. I am more afraid of these people than I am redneck killers. I kid you not. Okay, they, these are scary people. So I avoid painting the auras, which I was seeing for a long time, and then I start putting them into the painting. Um, and sure enough, right, the first time I do a slide presentation on these paintings in Texas, I get a question. What do you feel about Jesus Christ? Okay. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, right? I mean, the minute you see auras, you are in a religious category. Auras appear in religious paintings, uh, not in other paintings. So. My answer to him was, if Jesus walked into this room at this moment, I would offer him a cup of coffee. Next question. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> oh, too many dumb stories. I, they're endless. I go into the caves in 1970 in the Jordan. You can get in, I could get into the caves. Now you go into replicas of the caves. You don't go into Lascaux, you go, they built a replica next door. When I went in in 1970, there were no guards. There were six people there, and people were rubbing their hands all over the cave drawings. It was pretty outrageous. But what I realized in the cave drawings was there were drawings done on top of each other. And I thought, why would they do that? Why would different artists draw on top of each other's paintings? I mean, in our culture, 
as a graffiti artist, that's tagging, and people are very upset by it. So I read, I read, I read, I read, time goes by, I can't get these images out of my brain, whatever. And then I read a theory that I actually believe is true, which is that people went into the caves after the shaman had done these drawings, put their hands on these drawings to get the energy back. While their eyes are being told the story, their bodies were feeling the energy. So the more drawings on top of each other, the more energy. And when you look at the handprints in the caves, it isn't one handprint, it is entire generations of handprints. You've got the great-grandfather's print, you've got the father's print in it, you've got the kids' print in it. So if you put your hand on those hands, you are feeling five generations of energy. So I start doing these things. I don't know what they are, right? <laughs> In the middle of it, I find a little photograph of a rock painting from South Africa that's got a rainbow transition in the middle of a human form and an animal form. And I thought, of course, they're using it as a symbol for the transition because you can't wander out into this other space without an animal helper. So that's what these are about. My gay friends have all complimented me and said, we're so happy you're using the gay symbol. And I said, you know, the rainbow's been around a long time, but uh, yeah, I think that's it. When I was uh, younger, I introduced uh, Marshall to my parents, and from that point on, they would always say, are you still spending time with the troubled artist? <laughs> um, much less troubled is Ruth Ansel. She was the youngest uh, art director, co-art director of Harper's Bazaar. She worked, uh, I learned a few years ago, for Eric Nietzsche, who was uh, a truly amazing designer. Um, but when I had always heard about her as I was working through my pornographic phase, uh, not in any strict connection whatsoever, uh, but I'd always wanted to meet her, and the day we had lunch, which you may remember or not, was at that Greek place on 8th Avenue, uh, was one of the more thrilling days of my life. So uh, with that, please welcome Ruth Ansel. to be a raconteur. <laughs> Thank you. I can't talk those stories, but mostly I can't remember them, which is worse. <laughs> Thank you for uh, reminding me that I did something that I feel is still important, and that is went in there and fought for something. Whether it got on the page or not, at least it was worth the fight. But thank you, Marshall, you are a strange man. <laughs> Which is part of the reason that uh, I was so thrilled to see the work. But I remember, I remember you coming up and I was thinking, this is gonna be in the New York Times Magazine. A lot of people are gonna see this and they're basically people who've never seen anything like this in their life because they don't go to museums. Some of them live in Montana, some of them live in Moscow, and I loved the idea that the work was being seen uh, by folks who wouldn't have the opportunity to see it, which is why I think I went into the magazine business, more or less, well, not the business, but I went into magazine design, because I really felt it was a democratic way of being able to work with great artists that I really admired, and getting, getting it out there, you know, whether it got out there and seen, it was seen uh, by people who appreciated it or whether it got out there and people didn't care about it, it got out there. And I thought that was pretty, pretty important. So uh, thanks for reminding me that I did that. And Steve, I can only say, that the greatest moment of my life at the New York Times was when you came in with that portfolio, I opened it up and saw it was Screw Magazine. And frankly, I don't think I saw a Screw Magazine except on the newsstand cover. I don't think I bought it. I might have, but I don't think so. 
And I was so happy to see this crazy pornographic magazine done with this, with this guy who cared about graphics. And I thought, this is insane. I have to do something which was probably equally as insane. I have to see if the New York Times is as liberal as they say they are and make sure that this portfolio of great work, irreverent work, pornographic work, was going to, you know, was going to make them, you know, sit up and turn away or whether they were going to do something about it and they did something about it. So I have to say, not only is that to Steve's credit, but I have to say it's the credit of those editors who said, welcome to the New York Times. I remember at the New York Times to show you the, 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 the misogynist place that it was. When I was hired, um, which was mid-74, I think, they used to have a stat room in the back of where I, uh, you walked, you know, in the back. And this is a 24-hour building. And they didn't have too many women working there, certainly no women in the art departments at that point. And I used to go back and ask, and, and, and walk into the stat room, and they had nude picture after nude picture after nude picture, I mean, really bad nudes on the wall. And they would see if they could get a rise out of me. You know, if I would say, wow, you know, what the hell are you doing with these nudes? Take it off the wall. And I said nothing. <laughs> so after a few months, they decided I was okay. And then they took the pictures down, which was really interesting, without my saying a word. Then maybe they put up worse pictures in their lockers, but <laughs> they didn't put it out there. So sometimes it's good to just cool it and uh, see what happens. So let's see how I do this. I, I, I don't do this very much, so I, I, don't have the, I don't have the cool that Marshall has. Uh, but I'm going to show the work, right? How do I do this? Okay. Did I do it? Uh, this is, you know, the interesting thing about how I got to do what I did, and I guess do what I do, is that I had absolutely no plan, absolutely none whatsoever. Uh, I got out of I got out of art school uh, as a fine artist knew that I needed to work, didn't know how I was going to find any job, and um, had a fine art portfolio with a few very lame things in it. And um, I took it around, and nobody knew what the hell they were looking at. I mean, they just, they just laughed. And, and, uh, and I was lucky enough to get a job with Eric Nietzsche, which is a quite great name, who paid me nothing. I was in a, it was the first time I got the, had the word apprentice used. Anyway, I don't want to get into it. I apprenticed for him, I worked, I worked for him because I lived at home in the Bronx with my parents, and it was the only way that I could afford it. And I learned how to clean up rubber cement. That's what I learned. And I learned how to be neat and, you know, and, and, uh, and paint his incredible, you know, he did a lot of illustrations for, uh, for uh, submarines, um, they were atomic submarines, so it was kind of a strange place to be. But at any rate, what I'm trying to say is, you don't have to start any special way at all. You just have to start by being interested in where the best work is being done. And I was very lucky. I got to Bazaar because I thought Henry Wolf was there. And I called up and said, I want to I wanna come and show my portfolio. This was the early 60s. And they said, Henry Wolf isn't here, Marvin Israel's here. I said, I don't know who Marvin Israel is. Uh, and uh, Henry Wolf was at Show Magazine. And I went to Show Magazine, and Henry, who knew a little bit about me, not much, said, listen, I don't have any work for you, but go back to Marvin, because I think there's a place open. And that's exactly how I got the job. There was one place open in the art department. Bia Feitler was there. She was his star pupil. And um, it was Bia, Marvin, myself, and a secretary in this really run-down, crummy, Hearst place. 
And that's how it began. It began with absolutely no plan, which is what I think um, is the most interesting thing about how anybody gets where they go. I think the only thing you have to have is curiosity, and the only thing you have to have with curiosity is know where the good work is being done. If you don't know where the good work is being done, then you're going to be in trouble from the beginning. And you have to start with where the good work is done. So, um, I went to a place of original thinkers without knowing that I was the luckiest kid in the world. This um, work at Bazaar, 1960s, uh, Marvin Israel was the art director. Deanna Vreeland was the editor. Was well, Actually, she was not the editor-in-chief. She was the fashion editor. She couldn't get the editor-in-chief's job. Stupid then. And um, Bia Feiler was, as I said, uh, in the art department. And Dick Avedon was the resident photographer. So if you fall into that, <laughs> If you fall into that place and you're young, you have to be pretty much an idiot if you don't get what's going on around you. And I just, you know, I got in there, I didn't know anything, I didn't know who Brodovich was, I didn't know what graphic design was, but I knew I was someplace that was thrilling. And the thrilling part of it was they all dared each other to do their best work and therefore I had to somehow you know, reach that bar or get kicked out. And very often it was close to being kicked out. Anyway, you're, gonna, you know, you're looking at work, this hero, a fantastic, you know, inventive photographer who was Avedon's assistant who actually came from Japan and swept the floors at Avedon's studio. And uh, they had no connection to each other, which, is kind of, which kind of made it great. And he became this master hero of uh, invention. Long before there was Photoshop, this is not Photoshop, there was no Photoshop. This was all done with layers of, uh, of uh, clear acetates, one over the other. He did thousands of variations and brought it in. The fact that it's the cover, you know, I don't even know if they would do a cover like that today. This is an interesting cover, because this is the cover that got Marvin Israel fired. <laughs> this is the cover that got Marvin Israel fired, because Marvin and Dick were like naughty little boys who didn't really like Nancy White, who was the editor. Or they didn't think that she had the stuff that Freeland had. So they conspired to get this wonderful young woman to put on a snood, which Vreeland used to wear, and, wear and, and put in her mouth this you know, cigarette holder, and it really was a shock. Uh, as you can see at 63, that's kind of when Bea and I became art directors, but it was done a few months before then. Anyway, uh, Nancy White, called Marvin in and said, what the hell is this? This, is, this looks like a man in drag. And, uh, and he said, fuck you. She said, you're fired. <laughs> and he left that day, which is pretty extraordinary. And Bia and I were left in the art department, two young girls, and had no ambition to be, at least I didn't, maybe Bia did. Um, and we were made co-art directors, which I think was really a holding pattern. It was just about, okay, these two girls will hold on till we get a man, till we get a man in here, and then we'll see. But somehow, even though we were paid very much less than maybe what it should have been, they, they thought we did okay. This is Hero again. I mean, look at it. The invention of that is extraordinary. Still like it. This is Hero again. We did some fold out and fold down covers. There's one over there with a leg. Uh, these were, you know, these were inventive times. I don't know what I can say about invention in magazines, except I wish there was more of it going on today. I mean, the beauty of magazines to me, as I said, is it's really a democratic place 
to show high-level, non-democratic solutions, meaning individuals who have great talent can be hired by magazines, particularly fashion magazines at that time, and they can rip, you know, let it rip. They can, they can do the best they can and be inventive as they can, and as long as somehow something is showing that seems like uh, it satisfies the, the editor, you get it published. Uh, I think that's an, an amazing accomplishment. And you get it published month after month. You know, one of the best things about being in a magazine is you can fail a lot, and there were plenty of failures. They all didn't look like this, uh, things we did. But what you do is you just fail and you press on and you do the next issue. You know, it's kind of like a, a theater group in, uh, in the theater. You, you just do the next thing and the next thing and somehow something, maybe over a year's time, will, will be worth remembering. This is a, 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 you know, turns out to be an iconic shoot. I was on that shoot. This was in Paris. I was sent to Paris by Marvin, who didn't want to go because he was having a fight with his wife. And uh, this was Mel Sokolsky, uh, who has a book out on this, which I don't even have yet. I, I hope to buy it. Uh, the, these were the very, you know, twice a year there was something called the Paris Collections. And the best Paris Collections were always kept for Dick Avedon because that was uh, the full which meant that you could photograph in the summer. Remember, this is when there were no jets. You had to fly prop. <laughs> and uh, the work was sent back and forth on prop planes. Ama amazing, right? Pictures, photographs. That was the way it was done. Anyway, Mel devised this incredible concept because he had looked at paintings of Hieronymus Bosch I don't know if you know Hieronymus Bosch, but there's something called the Gardens of Delight. Fantastic painting. Kind of reminds me <laughs> a little of Marshall's sentiment. <laughs> it, has, it has a lot of wonderful weirdnesses going on. People in hell being eaten by other people, all kinds of fornication and strange things happening. Uh, but it had this f ball floating through it. Mel got fascinated, which is what you have to be in this business. You have to be fascinated, obsessed, and then you have to follow through. Mel decided that he wanted to go to that collection and bring this. He had to pay for it himself. There was no money. Bazaar didn't pay for it. He went to some airplane in industrial place to find out how he could get this made. It's an industrial plastic, which wasn't even known about. Had it made, had it shipped over to Paris, and this was the coldest winter in Paris. I think maybe it was, there was no day that this girl did not go into this ball that was higher than 20 degrees out, maybe 15, in chiffon dresses. You figure out who has the balls and was these girls. I mean, amazing stuff. And this was done by hanging, this was done by hanging this ball on a great big crane and then swinging that crane over the Seine. And, and, and this picture, actually, and then we retouched out, you know, the chain. But this was this girl being swung over the Seine. She had nothing in there to communicate with us, no cell phone, nothing. And they swung it and didn't hear stop. So it started to go down into the water. And her feet and the shoes were, you know, just you know, water was coming in in between, and nobody could figure out how to get Simone signaled, but eventually they signaled her and they pulled her up. That's the kind of stuff that, um, I don't know what to say, except that's dedication, right? Uh, these great pictures, Mel Sikorsky deserves all the credit for. This is a hero picture for Bazaar. Uh, some of the great work that he did had to do with, uh, it, it had to, you know, what is this? It's about imagination, together with a, a great sense of what fashion can be at its best. And that means that women weren't considered stupid who bought this magazine. This was a real owl. This was not a stuffed owl. And Hero had managed to get a real owl in there and uh, took the picture. 
The beauty of this, again, is uh, the picture opposite it was made after the owl pictures with the, with the uh, jewels. If you look at that, I'm sorry, if you look at that picture, this is where Vreeland comes in. She, had man she went to the manufacturer and said, I want you to make a feather coat for me. I want that feather coat to be opposite this owl. And they made clothes for her so that you as a reader were getting an experience that was truly, you know, the, the highest level of creativity. This was not the manufacturer making something and giving it to the magazine and say, photograph it. This was a woman with enormous imagination and inspiration saying, here's what I tell you you should do, and they all, you know, did it because they knew that it would make them better. Andy Warhol was a friend as, uh, were, you know, I, I came from the art world, so I didn't know from fashion. And um, we had to do cars uh, every once in a while to make money for the manufacturer, you know, the car manufacturers wanted to uh, advertise. So Andy was given this assignment. He was given these cars. I don't even remember that. There's some museum who did a show on this and it interviewed me about it. I half forgot what I said, but basically he was given catalogs to, to make silk screens of the cars because he didn't even have the actual cars. And he put together these paintings and I'm amazed that it ran. Uh, imagine, this was Bazaar's way of showing the latest cars that were out on the market. Who would do that today? I don't know. This was something that we had to do that had to show uh, fabric. This was something that had to do with talking about polka dot shoes. Uh, these were you know, various moments. I think the one at the bottom was Bob Richardson of Mia Farrow. The other two are hero. It's the first time we used, uh, what, do you, what do you call that? Green light, I don't know what that's called. Uh, uh, huh? I don't know. Fluorescent, first time we used fluorescent. You know, we were always looking for ways to push the envelope uh, in terms of the materials we were using. It's more stuff. This was kind of interesting because it didn't show any image. And here was some shoes. We always did very well with shoes because shoes, you know, we were allowed to be more inventive. But you can believe those shoes were made to look like shiny cars. There was a lot of conversation between the editor, <coughs> who was a great editor, and shoe manufacturers, and she got them to make those shoes look like shiny cars. That wouldn't happen today. These kids, um, were photographed in the studio because they couldn't afford to send us on location. So Hero got a trampoline and some glass and did these incredibly inventive images. Steve McQueen, first man, big man's head on the cover of a woman's magazine. And the only reason that happened was um, because the bracelets were very expensive and they wanted some uh, Diamond, thank you. They wanted, they wanted uh, some high-end advertising. And Steve McQueen was then the biggest, highest paid star. Again, why this is interesting in detail is, you know, this stuff didn't, doesn't just happen. The editor was very angry at us because we didn't have enough men in the magazine. She said, God, you know, you don't have enough men in the magazine, you know, because she wanted kind of advertising for that. And the question was with Avedon, well, how can we get a man on the cover that's not just a regular man on the cover? It took months to think about it. And then this came together with Steve McQueen, who is this bad boy sex symbol in a tux, and this hand that came up, and somehow it ran. Uh, I think it probably wouldn't run today because it doesn't show enough women's fashion. This was a wonderful drop-down cover by Jimmy Moore. This is a, another wonderful cover fold out by Hero. I'm going slow, but this was the 1965 issue which started with that big pink helmet. And that's an interesting story briefly, only because everybody thinks that you know, great people like the great Avedon, I thought too, you know, you don't, you kind of, 
you tiptoe around somebody so great and you don't really talk too much with them, you just listen. Well, Avedon um, and I and Bia really created for the first time, conceptualized a whole fashion issue. He was the photographer and editor. Never happened before that and never happened since where he had that kind of control. But he deserved the control because he was better than anybody else capable of understanding what was going on outside in the world and sexual revolution, beginning to go to, you know, people going to the moon. Uh, Dylan was, you know, Dylan was, Dylan's music, rock music was the most important thing happening. Everything was converging. And by the way, something about good work or being able to do your best work has a lot to do with the timing by you know, just the sheer timing of when you're doing it. I mean, Steve Jobs, who is my hero in terms of being able to do something in a contemporary way, and I know nothing about technology, but he came along at a time when there was a real reason that somebody with his kind of amazing mental embrace could take technology and art and decide he was gonna make both important so that there was a real uh, marriage of the two in the work. And I think um, this issue came along because it was, it was just the, the you know, explosion of the youth movement. And we were pretty young and we were keyed into that. And to give Bizarre and its kind of stuffy people credit, they allowed it. The issue was a tremendous failure. Uh, the Southern advertisers pulled in James Galanos, who was a very high-end uh, couture designer in California, didn't want a black model wearing his clothes. And Dick had to convince them to do it. And Southern publishers pulled out. Now, you know, you don't know the backstory, but that's an interesting backstory. Anyway, the best, the best part of this page is Dick hated the picture of, because she was against no seam. It didn't mean anything. And he was saying, what can we do? What can we do? I literally ran out to the local newsstand, grabbed comic books that were there. I was very aware, obviously, of R Lichtenstein. Saw this, ripped it up, or not didn't rip it up, grabbed, grabbed the page, blew it up, cut her up, and put it over it, and that became the spread. Now, how lucky was I to find that? I mean, that was not a lot of research. It was strictly luck. Uh, Dylan, Silver Ink. You know, this is all that I did ask Roy if he had something for the issue. He had this, so we used it. Uh, these were real astronaut suits. But for, you know, amazing that they let us have them. You know, they didn't think that maybe we'd steal the secrets. Uh, Courage. And now we're in the New York Times. Uh, what I love about the New York Times was I really felt, you know, after the assassinations in 68 of uh, Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, I thought, what the hell am I doing in fashion? You know, I love fashion, nothing, I still love it. But there was something that was happening that I felt I, I, uh, I ought to find out what's going on in the world. And uh, I was very fascinated with the New York Times because I respected it and I, I, I loved the magazine. So Lou Silverstein, who I, I never took a course in graphic design. Lou Silverstein was teaching a course in graphic design someplace. I, sat in for two days and really couldn't follow it. And he saw that I, you know, the chair was empty. Anyway, he called me, he said, well, Ruth, what are you up to? Because I had, I think I had just gotten fired from uh, Scally McCabe and Sloves, which was, <laughs> which was an advertising agency. I was not good at advertising because I can't sell what I don't believe in. I'm really bad at that, I have to kind of get I have to believe in it and I have to feel that something good is going to come of it. Anyway, he said, what are you, I said, I know, I'm, not, I'm up to nothing. I just got fired. 
And he said, why don't you come over and talk to me? You want to do the magazine? I said, no, I cannot stand deadlines. I'm really, really lazy and bad at it. Anyway, the story was that he convinced me to, to take it on, and I did. And it was one of the best periods of my life because not only, you know, the fun part of being an art director is you have to learn all the time. So I learned who are the new photographers who are great photojournalists, who are the great artists like Marshall, you know, who, who could contribute to something as important as the New York Times Magazine. And, um, and who could I bring in from my background uh, it, at Bazaar that would be different? And the center picture is Judith Jamison done by Bill King. Now that was done overnight. You know, there was no time. There was an overnight shoot that had to be done. Bill King took her in the studio, did the shoot, sent the shoot in. It became a cover. Those are the magic things that happen. But, you know, you have to have everybody who's willing to say yes under great, you know, under great stress. And that's the fun of doing what you do. Um, picture on the end is Peter Beard. What I loved about these, I mean, the purpose of what I was doing at the New York Times is I made up my mind that I thought that the covers could be posters. So you open up this, you know, in those days, the New York Times was a gray sea of type. There was no color. So the only color was the magazine. And I thought, well, if you're opening up this gray, big, you know, two and a half pound bunch of type, that why not have some joy, you know, looking at these covers? And that's exactly what I tried to do. So I didn't spend a lot of time working on the inside. I was, I, I, I rather regret that the type design wasn't so good. And I, I think it got much better with my successor. They, they did a much better job. But again, there were no computers. So this was very much hands-on. <laughs> Uh, that was uh, that was a cover that came from looking at a uh, uh, passport of Hemingway. I mean, how beautiful is that, right? So, I mean, that's what became the cover. This was Seymour Quast when New York was going down the drain. Now we get to Vanity Fair. Most important thing about Vanity Fair was um, strange. Bia was supposed to do Vanity Fair. She had cancer and didn't survive. I had no interest in doing Vanity Fair. I actually was hired by Condé Nast to do their new version of House and Garden, which they wanted to make very sophisticated, not like a service magazine, and I got interested in, in architecture at that time. So I thought, great, I want to leave the New York Times. I'm exhausted, I can't work this weekly anymore. And, um, I lasted a very short time, and then Alex Lieberman called me and said, uh, I want you to come to Vanity Fair. It was literally over a weekend, and I had to work with Tina Brown in a two-week period to create Vanity Fair at the beginning, which wasn't so hot. That was, uh, <laughs> this is a Helmut, Helmut Newton, some of you know, and Helmut was one of the best photographers I've ever worked with. I mean, you know, these people were amazing because you didn't have to tell them anything. You just had to give them the assignment and they knew what to do. And Helmut is a funny story. Helmut was uh, taking this for the Pina Bausch uh, dance troupe, very avant-garde dance troupe. And he tells a story about how uh, he said to Pina Bausch uh, and to this, to this dancer, listen, I want to take a picture of you, you know, with this creature who's really, you have to think of him as another dancer. And she was wearing underpants, because she wouldn't take her pants off. And apparently, by the time the shoot finished, he had her taking her pants off, and he said, don't worry, nobody will recognize you. <laughs> so she did it. And it's, this picture would have been terrible had the pants stayed on. And that's the difference between a great photographer and a not so great photographer. They can do that. And uh, some more stuff at Vanity Fair, Annie Leibowitz pictures, and Keith Haring did a cover, thank God. Uh, this is a great Annie Leibowitz shoot. 
And it's one of my favorite Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> that was an early layout. The Whoopi Goldberg was an amazing picture. Annie is a genius at doing research. And she found out that uh, Whoopi had a, uh, had a routine about when she was a little girl, she wanted to be white. And she thought if she could take a bath in milk, that she would become white. So she would you know, take a bath. So Annie said, that's what I want to do. And that's a great picture. Uh, this is a, just a wonderful piece of work by Helmut and Michael Roberts, who's, uh, who was brought over from London by Tina. Man Who Fell to Earth. That's an Annie picture. Great. Worcester group. More covers. Woody Allen. And I did some Versace work, uh, thanks to Avedon. And this was the New Yorker Avedon, uh, Avedon work. This was one of the last portfolios I did with Dick, be, be, and he died suddenly of a, of a brain hemorrhage in Texas. Uh, this portfolio was not completed. Anyway, uh, I thought, you know, look at how young Barack Obama looks and how innocent, poor guy. And it was one of, it was one of the great pairings. Uh, this was another great, you know, Dick and a lot of good photographers can make anybody take their clothes off any time. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And uh, this is a, a, a wonderful action, active picture about stopping AIDS. Peter Beard and I worked together in a Bazaar when he first was dating all the models he could get his hands on in Bazaar. And he was a very handsome guy and got his hands on a lot of them. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so we, we kept, we kept uh, up during the years, and I'm very proud. That's that book that's over there. It's a big monograph that I don't, I don't particularly believe in big monographs that you can't lift, but Toshin has made a series of these books, and I thought nothing could be better suited to Peter than, than to do something this big because it related to his own diaries. So I made the book kind of look like a facsimile of Peter's diaries. This was a book I did with Avedon. This was a, not such a good cover that I did with Annie. Uh, this was pictures of Bia and myself, the only set of pictures that Avedon ever took. I don't think he ever thought we were important enough to take serious pictures of. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but he did this little shoot. And uh, literally, we walked into the studio. He was writing an article for Graphis about us uh, way back in you know, 64. And he said, sit down, girls, you know, sit down on the piano bench. I'll take a picture for the article. And that's, that's, that's what that was. This is uh, finally, uh, I, threw a, I threw a costume party uh, with a movie theme back in my then husband's uh, art studio. And Deanne, Deanne Arbus was a friend. Deanne did a lot of work at Bazaar. And I came uh, as, uh, who did I come as? Lulu, uh, from, from uh, one of the femme fatale Lulu, and Bia was uh, Marlena Dietrich. So I had no time to make a costume, and I had gone to the closet, the Harper's Bazaar jewelry closet, and just pulled everything I could and just sewed it on myself. And half of it was dripping off as the night went on. But it was a good night. Robert Frank was taking pictures. I mean, the point of that time was uh, nobody was too big to, you know, to be unapproachable. And we were all kind of uh, people who were, who were doing things together, and magazines and artists were on the same level. In other words, uh, you know, it, 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 was not, it was not something that was a separation. As a matter of fact, it was a coming together. So I had the very good fortune of um, being in the right place at the right time. And that's really true. You know, you do need luck. And the luck hap happens to be what I think has to do with you have to decide 
that you want to work with the best people you can possibly work with. No matter what you're doing at the beginning, even if you're sweeping floors, you got to do that. That's my, that's my only advice. And if it gets to be better than that, it, you, you know, great. If it's worse than that, look elsewhere. But never, ever sell out and do something that doesn't have to do with you being passionate around people who are passionate, who can just, you know, make your head spin with how imagine how their imagination you know makes you realize that you have a lot to learn so i had a lot to learn thank you hey marsh come on up uh first of all it's been a long long time since i was in Ruth's office, watching her put together uh, the magazine at the Times. And I used to do things by throwing things on the page and whatever stuck, stuck. And it looks like that if you look at my old stuff. And I used to watch uh, Ruth taking such care and really talking about what she was doing so articulately. And a little while ago, she said, I can't get up here and really talk about stuff. You've got to ask me questions. But she was amazing, wasn't she? Yeah. First question I do have is, to both of you, what is that thing that you've done that was the most challenging, the hardest to get through, the thing that you're most proud of? And would you do it again? I don't know. I, I, uh, <laughs> my wife's uncle was Minoru Yamasaki, who was the architect for the Trade Center. I'm sliding the question. Go ahead. And You'll come back to it. I know you will. He was giving me a tour of his house, and at that point, he had already built the Trade Center. And I said, Minoru, I'm trying. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm trying to ask him a dumb question. I said. Menorah, tell me, I, what are you the most proud of? And he said, I am the most proud of the fact that my mother lived with me longer than I lived with her. So I, 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 I don't really, I, my sense of this is that, that my answer is not an art what. <laughs> when I was 18, my mother said, I'll make two deals with you. You will never live with me again. I will never live with you again. We kept that to you and never sent me a picture because I hate your pictures and I won't hang them on the wall. Um, but in terms of the work, I don't know. I mean, there was always panic without question. That was part of the fun for working at the Times. I mean, that there was no time. I mean, there was like, here it is, you got two days, we need to finish Thursday morning. That was really exciting uh, to stay up all night. Um, as I got older, it got less exciting. Uh, but I think the work, the times got less exciting. It's hard to explain this. I know Ruth and I are talking like we are, right? Two old people talking about the good old days. But there was a sense of urgency that everybody was involved with. And that doesn't exist today. If it does, I don't feel it. It's happening somewhere else. I don't see it. Um, and it shows up on the pages. Is that fair? Whatever the urgency was then, um, I think, for me, I mean, I do have an answer. I, I, don't, I, don't, have a, uh, <laughs> I don't have an anecdotal story. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have an anecdotal story. I was, as I said, very, very lucky. Can you imagine? having the Holy Trinity, you know, Deanna Vreeland, Marvin Israel, Richard Avedon, mentoring you through the first, you know, level, if you want to call it, you know, it's kind of levels of, of Dante, up or down. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't even know what a mentor meant. All, all I knew was, the work that um, 
that was coming out of these three people that was uh, enveloping me, I either had to rise to the occasion or I, I would have been out. And a lot of times I was close to being out because I was very lazy. And I also had this extremely warped idea of what I thought or how I thought talent functioned. I thought all you had to do was be talented, whether you were a musician or an artist or a singer. And you just stood there and the talent carried you. I had no idea how hard these people worked, none. I had no idea that the talent was very little and the hard work was the whole foundation. So it took me a long time to get that. And when the 1965 April issue, which is that pink helmet one of Gene Shrimpton, happened, it was the best experience of my life because I had to work harder than I ever worked before. And I had to, um, it's called deliver, you know? We, we all can talk and talk and talk, but finally you have to deliver. And the fact that Avedon expected of me to do that for him amazed me. That, that, you know, that was the best experience of my life because it was from the beginning to the end a total and complete, you know, it was like, it was like a concerto. It was the total and complete song. And I was very lucky. Was there any uh, of this in your family? Did this just kind of happen uh, in a generative way, or was Were there Were there some... Jewish gypsies running around? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, you know, no. As a matter of fact, I remember Dick once asked me, what is your background? And I, you know, what could I say? I mean, my uncle owned a famous restaurant downtown called Moskowitz and Lupowitz. Uh, my, my mother was a very simple woman, and my father was an extremely simple man. And the art of any kind had nothing you know, didn't enter the house. But oddly enough, your brother was also in the business. My brother was in the business. He went to City College and he took a film course, uh, which kind of led him to become a, a commercial film director, yeah. And then he became smart and went into real estate in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lesson. <laughs> so, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I can't wait to get in and do whatever I do. If I don't have something to do, I make something to do. Um, could you wake up in the morning without something on your easel or your desk or your, in your studio? No, I, I it's too long an answer. I, you know, what I found is that on any given day I go into the studio, I have five options. I have a drawing in progress, I have a painting in progress, I have some of a woodcut somewhere. So I can decide as I walk into the room how much energy I have that day and basically control it, unlike people who have real jobs. So on a low energy day, I can cut a piece of wood. Uh, on a low energy day, I can paint in the background. Uh, on a high energy day, I can actually start a painting. So it's been useful for me to also be dragged out of my studio and have to go to school. I mean, it's been incredibly useful. I, I love to bitch about it, but the real truth is I'm a hermit, and if you leave me alone, I would never come out of there, and I would drink myself to death in about a year. Uh, not good. So I need to be dragged back into other people, um, and school provided that, and I soon realized that this was really healthy for me, and that being unhealthy would be locked up in this room uh, with only me. Uh, and your thoughts. And my thoughts for too long a period. So, uh, but it's the option that, that I've learned to really like in terms of where I go on any given day with stuff. Ruth, you've worked with many really great people and the stories really are fantastic. But you were uh, Avedon's art director for a while. Yeah, Mary Shanahan was in his studio. Uh, sorry, Mary Shanahan was in his studio. Uh, he, he had a, he had an 
in-house art director. When he was working for the uh, New Yorker, he, you know, they had a very quick turnaround. They, it's a, you know, they had, they had the need to have images from his files. He was a very smart guy, Dick, you know, it was amazing. Uh, when he was at the end of his career, which was then, uh, in the 90s, uh, he had a file, file after file of great photographs of, of great people, in cultural people, political people. And he made a deal with Tina Brown, he said, uh, you know, who was then at uh, the New Yorker. He said, look, if you need images of these people, it's not like they've changed that much over, you know, over a certain period of time. So why don't, you know, you have access to, the, to my files and you can run, uh, you know, Stephen Sondheim or whoever it is. Or, or, and, and then on top of that, he would, do, he would do assignments for them. So that's why he had that, he had one of us in the studio. And then at the time, he was doing work for Versace. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was a great treat to be working in, in the studio with him, uh, doing these various things. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance. Uh, I mean, I did work on the 60s book, but I, I think that book was very flawed. And uh, I won't go into it now, but I mean, a lot of it had to do with me, a lot of it had to do with a lot of things. But uh, I wish it was better. But the, you know, that was a great opportunity. And the thing I, you know, the, I say this over and over again because it's true. Unless I saw it, you know, firsthand, I really think I would have been walking around like an idiot, thinking that you know, Fred Astaire and great people that I admire just got up there and danced. <laughs> you know, they just danced. And, uh, and I had no idea how much hard work the really great people do. And that's what I learned, and it's a very important lesson. And I learned it working around people like Avedon. Are there any questions in, from the audience? Yes. Good question. I, um, to answer it personally, which is, I don't do sketches. Uh, and so the deal I made with art directors was always, I will give you a finish on your sketch date. If you do not like my finish, don't pay me and I'll go home. It was the best deal I could make because I can't translate a sketch into a finish. It's a personal problem I have. So I, the idea of doing it on the computer, uh, I've never really tried it. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I'm a romantic, and when I'm working, I love the fact that I'm smelling the same smell Goya smells. <laughs> I, I love the fact that I got the same material. I hate him for it. Do you understand? I mean, I would like Goya to have a trick. Um, it bothers me that he had what I have, but at the same time, there's a, a romance in this idea. Um, I don't, I mean, it's just a funny story about the beginnings of this, but um, Adele Rodriguez was the art director of International Time. I did a cover for him. He called me back and he said, you know, I think the cover would be better if there was a red background. And I said, you got a computer, Adele, right? You know, I mean, change it, right? He said, no, no, that's not ethical. And I said, what do you mean that's not ethical? He said, no, that wouldn't be right. You know, he said, you know, you do these great reds, you know, it's like, I want you to repaint it so it's authentic. And I said, Adele, I have no idea how I mix that red, number one. You're going to get closer to the red with your computer than I am trying to remember what I put into it. Anyway, he wouldn't do it, and he sent it back. The beginning of this process, and I'll stop, I do... <laughs> McVeigh, the, the Oklahoma bomber for Playboy. The only true thing I put in the drawing, I blew up his face, right? Scattered, whatever. And I'm looking at reference photos, and I realized that all the prison uniforms in Oklahoma are pink. I thought it was funny. I thought, holy shit, they're pink. So I paint in a pink uniform on McVeigh. 
I get a call from Kerry Pope, the art director. Kerry says to me, listen to this, right? I don't know how to tell you this, Mark, but we did a really quick colored Xerox. Color was way off. And we sent it to Hugh in California. <laughs> and Hugh called and said, don't change a thing. I love it. Right? And I said, Kerry, you son of a bitch, you have changed something in my painting. And he said, well, the pink uniform seemed really wrong, you know. And so they changed the pink uniform to a brown uniform. What I'm getting at here is that when I brought original art in, it was harder for editors to change it because it took time to change it. That's not true anymore. Does that make sense? I mean, people are looking at images saying, give me a green background, give me a red one. I don't like that one, do whatever. Because everybody thinks now that it doesn't take much time to do it. At least that's my perception from the outside. So um, I don't quite know what that means. I think people are doing amazing things in the computer. Uh, I miss the romance of turpentine, being able to smell it. I miss the romance of scissors. <laughs> but Ruth, what are you we're doing? talking to some old people up old here? People, old people, old people. We're Mar talking Mar rubber cement. You know what I mean? Rubber I mean, cement. Marshall can uh, get away with using his hands, but uh, when you're working now, nobody accepts the the paste up. Listen, don't tell anybody, but I am <laughs> miserable on the computer uh, because I. First of all, there's nothing worse than being my age having to learn the computer, and I am a technological idiot. I mean, I really don't, you know, everybody says, oh, you'll eventually get it, you know, it'll speak to you and you'll feel comfortable. I've never felt comfortable with a computer. When it works, I'm happy. When it's not, I want to kill it. I mean, I just want to kill it. And I work alone, which means I don't have some terrific bright kid by my side when I go, holy shit, what do I do now? And, you know, so I'm awfully frustrated, and the truth is, I get, I hire people to help. Because, I mean, I like, I, I tell you what I don't like, which I, I remember once I was visiting David Hockney, because he was doing something for Vanity Fair, and I remember he said something which stuck in my head. He said, you know, I'm working with, he, he loved the, he was working with, um, was working with a, a copier who had this, he loved the black ink. He loved that it was powder that was richer than lithography. He went on and on about it. He said, but you know what I hate about it? I can't stand that I'm not working the final size, the right size. He couldn't stand that it was not the right size. And I, and I know that's one of the things that just confounds me on a computer. I mean, I look at the screen, I'm doing the layout, it's not the size that I'm actually going to be, you know, printing out. And I don't, you know, I don't know how Michelangelo and all those guys did it, you know, but they worked with maquettes and then they blew it up and they were right most of the time. It's a very hard thing to do. And I find that very disconcerting for where my mental process is. I, I like to work with the size of final, you know, whatever it is, whatever size the book is, whatever size the magazine is, it matters to not see it on the screen at a different size. Do you remember what you set type with? Headline type? When? At the magazine? Times magazine? Huh. Well, Do you remember was, what was in the office next to your office? No. A phototypositor. Anybody ever work with a phototypositor here? You did. You did. So you know it was like a Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, but I, I never knew how to use that machine. You walked by it. I never knew how to use that machine. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't know how to use any machine. I really, you know, give me a scissors, I'd be happy. It's a good machine. Anyone, yes, back there. Um, I was looking at uh, Ruth Ansel's uh, cover for the New York Times magazine over there. It's, you described it as the one during the time when New York was sort of going down the drain. It's, you've got sort of this colorful collage and it's bright and kind of playful and you've got this chunky slab serif which is kind of back in style now and it 
sort of got me thinking how everything is, seems to be cyclical in a way in design and in art, and I guess in society as a whole. Um, I was wondering if, if you guys have found that to be the case during your, the many years that you've spent in your respective industries, that design is sort of cyclical, style is cyclical, and you know, in a sense, things seem to come in and out of style. Style is a, is a, is a hard word for me uh, because I think, uh, you know, it was never about style for me. It was always about um, what reflects the time I'm living in and a little bit beyond it. In other words, I was always, uh, I was always excited and thrilled and frustrated if I couldn't figure it out. Um, about how to, how to solve a problem for the magazine that related to the time that that, that was going to be seen. So, I mean, I, I mean, for instance, you know, the Mickey Mouse, that was a piece about Disney, a very boring business piece. And I just, you know, had to fight that and find a way to make somebody stop and look at the, at the cover. So, um, I don't know about style so much as I do about going to the source of what, you know, what you're trying to solve, and hopefully, you know, being able to do something that's more exciting than what the manuscript tells you to do, and you know, that that's when it works, it's fun. When it doesn't work, you know, it's a failure. And Marshall, you've evolved considerably in your painting from copying Francis Bacon. <laughs> To today, can you answer that? Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I don't think about style either. I, I, I remember years ago, David Carson. I don't know, anybody know David Carson anymore? Uh, <coughs> he did a magazine called Beach Culture. And I'd seen a copy of the magazine. It made no sense at all. The, the columns didn't read together. He crisscrossed columns. It was really. And he called me up and he said, you got any pictures of water? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I art direct this magazine called Beach Culture. Nobody reads it. So I overlapped a type and I changed paragraphs. And as long as I see water, the surfers are happy. You got anything? And I said, well, I got an armadillo jumping off into a pool in Texas where Christ is crucified on all the telephone poles. He said, I'll take it. It's great. <laughs> I mean, I, it's a style issue. I, I watched that, which I thought was quite brilliant, right? That he was playing with laying type on type because nobody read it, right? Suddenly it became a style. And suddenly I was getting entries to exhibitions that I couldn't read. And I thought, this is not the application of the style. I mean, this should be readable, sensible, whatever. Um, so I don't, I don't think about that anymore in terms of what I do. I, I, uh, I, what I do know is that people who collect the later work I'm doing have no interest in the early work. People who collect the early work don't care about the later work. I mean, people seem to fall in categories for why they buy things. So. Uh, um, I don't know what to say to that, except, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I keep trying to follow the work. I can try to lead the work and, and say, well, okay, I'll keep doing this. But it gets boring. Much more fun to follow it and think, how did I get here? What is this about? Does that mean? Well, that's a good segue into winding down here. And, and uh, a final question, and then I want to give Ruth something, um, is, what do you want to do in the next couple of years? Ruthie? Breathe. <laughs> other than be sent. Other, other than breathing? <laughs> um, you know, I've said this and it was a lie and I hope I could say it and maybe I can make it true. I keep thinking, you know, the reason I got into the magazine business is because I originally was in love with film. And I thought that I would try to be a, a film title designer because Saul Bass was a hero of mine. Well, that didn't work out. And then I thought, well, you better shut up now because there's something called an iPad. 
and you can you can work on this iPad, this thing that miracle of miracles. It has sound, it has movement, it has images. Get to work, girl. And I haven't done anything because I don't even have an iPad. Does anybody <laughs> want to send Ruth an iPad? They're cheap. <laughs> but I think that um, I either have to shut up or show up. And I so far haven't done anything. Well, Marsh, you've done movies, you've done books, you've done novels, you've done... I've indulged myself. You've completely. indulged yourself considerably at the expense of our patients. Exactly. I, uh, so uh, what is it that you want to do? I don't know. I mean, I always have two or three things that I think of in front of me. Uh, having said that, I know that once I do them, uh, I've never had a career block. I, uh, which is not a good thing. I mean, I actually, I, I'm a workaholic. And I understood early on that, that what, what I was really terrified of was failing. And I was willing to work myself to death to prove it. Um, that is not a good trait. I don't know where I got it, uh, but I got it. And I still have it. So if I couldn't do this and go in and uh, fool around with whatever I'm doing, I, I don't know what that would do to me. Uh, nothing good. Um, so if any of you are workaholics and you're doing it because you're afraid of failing, I mean, the weird thing about failing is that once you fail, you never know it. The weird thing about getting hot is that you'll never know it. I mean, when I got hot as an illustrator in the 80s, I remember standing, I don't know why I remember this, with Wilson McLean in the men's room at a urinal. And Wilson McLean's like a really serious illustrator. And he turned to me and he said, you know, you're hot. And I said, Wilson, what are you talking about? He said, every goddamn magazine I open up, he said, you know, whatever, I'm working my ass off here. And like, everything I turn over, you're in it, you're hot. And I thought, wow. I didn't know that, you know, it's weird. It, it, it's like failure, it's like, well, I, I've done things I'm not proud of uh, that didn't work. Uh, they were failures, but there's always something else to do, maybe. I don't know, I don't, know. I don't have an answer, Steve. Well, you had an answer. <laughs> you, for all the answers you don't have, you have yeah. an answer. Now, uh, Ruth mentioned that uh, Steve Jobs was an idol uh, of hers. And she brought something with her that you want to read. I forgot about this. Uh, somebody gave me this the other day, and it so tickled me because it kind of puts in context how little we really know about our heroes. And I'm not talking about Jobs in this case. I'm talking about the man who wrote this to Jobs and what it really tells you about the level of the mentality of some of those heroes. So this is from the desk of Sean Connery. You all know who Sean Connery is? You know who Sean Connery is? Okay. So it's December 11th, 1998. It's Mr. Stephen Jobs, Mr. I love the, the address, care of Apple computers, one infinite loop. That's the name of the street, Cupertino, California. Mr. Jobs. I will say this one more time. You do understand English, don't you? I do not sell my soul for Apple or any other company. I have no interest in changing the world, that's in quotes, as you suggest. You have nothing that I need or want. You are a computer salesman. <laughs> I am fucking James Bond. <laughs> I can think of no quicker way to destroy my career than to appear in one of your crass adverts. Please do not contact me again. Best, Sean Connery. Now down at the bottom of this horrible piece of stationery, is a thing that says 007. So he thinks he's really 007. Well, thank you for sharing that. And being... uh, I, 
I feel very fortunate to have been part of this and to be with these two amazing people. I hope you realize how fortunate you are to have heard these stories as well. And for more, uh, there's a book that was published last year about Ruth uh, in this Hall of Femmes uh, series of great women designers and art directors, and uh, it can be purchased through the internet. And Marshall on his website has a lot of uh, his wares as well to sell. Uh, and uh, since they're not going to market themselves, I'm going to market it for them. Uh, go out and get Marshall get those and monkeys. for your own home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.